Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, we are welcoming uh, a, all of our members to a joint meeting of the House General and Housing Committee and the House Human Services Committee on Homelessness Awareness Day here at the State House. Um, for those watching, we're, we're not at the State House. We're across the parking lot at the Pavilion Building. In case you're trying to find us, that's where we are. Um, so uh, we would love to uh, go around the room briefly um, for introductions so people in the audience know um, who, who is sitting at the table and uh, what parts of the state we're from. And then um, we'll welcome a number of you up for testimony. And we so appreciate you being here. Wanna? I'll start off. I'm Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury, represent Washington Chittenden District. And I am the chair of general and housing. Uh, Representative Robin Chestnut Tandrum in Rutland Bennington District, uh, vice chair of housing and general. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Burroughs, and uh, I represent Windsor One, and I'm on the general and housing. Hello, uh, Emily Krasnow, representing Chitna Nine South Burlington. Good morning. I am Representative Mary Howard. I represent Rutland District 6. Good morning. I'm Larry Labor. I represent Essex, Orleans District 1, but then more. Joseph Parsons. I represent the towns of Newbury, Thompson, and Brock. Good morning. I'm Ashley Bartley. I live in Fairfax, but represent Franklin 1, which is Fairfax and mostly Georgia. I'm Kathleen James. I live in Manchester and represent Bennington 4. I'm Dennis Abounding. I represent Caledonia 3, which is Linden, Sutton, Sheffield, Wheelock, and Newark. Uh, Caleb Elder, uh, Addison 4 District. Good morning, Taylor Smith from Winooski. Good morning, Ray Garofano, Essex and Essex Junction. Good morning, Dane Whitman from Bennington. Good morning, Noah Hyman, South Burlington and Lumsden. Good morning, Kelly Payala, present Londonderry, Weston, Windhall, and Andover. Hey, folks, I'm Jubilee McGill. I'm from Bridport and also represent very New Haven and Weybridge. Uh, James Gregoire from Fairfield. I also represent Bakersfield and Fletcher. I am Jessica Bremstead, and I represent Shelburne and St. George. Good morning, everyone. My name is Teresa Wood. I'm chair of the House Human Services <laughs> Committee. I'm from Waterbury, and I also represent, along with Chair Stevens, uh, Bolton, Beals Gore, and Huntington. And we are... Um, very happy to welcome you all here. We have a, a couple of housekeeping things in case you need to use the restroom. It's just through the store and take a left and kind of like right before you come to the hallway where you came in, uh, there are restrooms there. And then for witnesses, if you could come around the back of the, the head of the table here and come around that, that way, um, don't go this way because there's kind of a stuff in the way, shall we say. <laughs> um, so that would be um, that would be great. And um, for the witnesses, when you come up to the table, in case you um, haven't witnessed, uh, been a witness here before, first off, we're all we, we kind of lined up here and it looks kind of a little ominous, but mm -hmm. it's not. We're just people just like everybody else in the room. And so we welcome you to um, share your information, to share your stories, and we are honoring that today. So um, we would... Um, love to have you join us. And when you come up here, um, just uh, state your name for the record so that we know all who are here. And in, in case you don't know, you, you will be filmed. This is being live streamed to YouTube. And uh, so there are most likely people also watching um, at home or from their office or wherever they uh, might be more comfortable than sitting around a table. Um, so uh, again, welcome, welcome here this morning. Um, the uh, first person we're going to have up is uh, Polly. Where's Polly? She's not. Oh, she's here. Oh, okay, Gus. That's all right. First person we're going to have up is uh, Gus Seely, um, who is the executive director of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. So, um, welcome. And uh, I, okay, I see you're already up there. You're going to share your screen. Um, okay. Wonderful. And I'll just say, if anybody else is going to share their screen for some reason and you haven't um, checked in with uh, Ron Wild or Lori Morse, um, please do so because you'll need to be made a co-host, okay? Thank you. Welcome. Well, 
Thank you very much, both chairs. And uh, it's a great privilege to be with you today to talk about homelessness. Um, I apologize that I'm not uh, either Frank Naff, who is the new um, head of the Housing and Homelessness Alliance, which is a new alliance, and I'm not Polly Major. Uh, and Polly thought that her instruction from Frank was to talk for about three minutes and then learned yesterday that there were only six witnesses and threw together this slideshow and then called me and she found herself not feeling well. So I'll do my best to deliver her thoughts, but I'm gonna share a few of my own and I apologize for things you may have heard me say either to the joint session, but, um, but maybe bears repeating or some of the testimony I've already provided in, the, in Chair Stevens' committee. Um, but for me, um, the issue of homelessness as an older person, it's one that um, is newly on the scene. I had a recent colleague say, oh, we can't do anything about that. The homeless have always been with us. And the truth for me as somebody who uh, started working in community action in 1977 at the, in the Head Start program is that homelessness was not an issue back then. The Committee on Temporary Shelter and most of the providers across the state didn't exist because real estate was relatively cheap in Vermont. And we have not just here in Vermont, but as Americans figured out how to monetize real estate in a million ways that my parents' generation didn't imagine. Uh, there weren't home equity loans back then. You didn't need to get a home equity loan to send your kids to college. Um, there wasn't Airbnb. And we've made housing much more expensive for a lot of different reasons. And Laura Collins gave you the quiz of the nine different reasons you could say housing is out of control, and, and the answer was all of them are true. There are two things that are particularly true from my perspective. One is that the cost of building any housing has gone up relative to Vermonters' incomes at a rate that none of us would have imagined. And we have lost housing to a variety of market forces, including second homes, and there being these, and as the slideshow will show you, we're producing a whole lot less than we used to. And the reality is that the market cannot produce housing for people of very modest means. It just doesn't do that. It only works when there's, when there's subsidy. Um, I do want to say to all of you that since the beginning of the pandemic, there's been something called Housing Recovery Working Group that includes my organization, the Housing Finance Agency, State Housing Authority, the Department of Housing and Community Development and the Agency of Human Services that's met pretty much at least twice a month, sometimes once a month to coordinate the utilization of resources and focus on what we can do. And I think a lot of good's been done, but not clearly not nearly enough uh, to solve this problem. I think it's gonna take public policy and gonna take dollars to actually solve it. They, that, um, that the governor suggested may not be sustainable, but I think we need to figure out how to sustain it. I do want to say to all of you, congratulations on Act 47, which is making a difference. Uh, the top right picture is um, uh, a rendering of what the building in White River Junction, the Thousand Gifts building will look like when it's rehabilitated as a shelter. It's a project that we've recently funded and has been recently permitted by Hartford after they had rejected uh, the Upper Valley Haven's request to build right across the street from their existing facilities uh, in a church that they were planning to purchase. <clears throat> that was rejected based on character of the neighborhood. Um, there were people who were opposed to this site and I think Act 47 made a difference there, made a difference with a shelter that will soon open in St. Johnsbury. Uh, in talking with Chair Stevens, the building you see that I hope will get under construction in Waterbury uh, this summer was subject of a 3-3 vote not to give it a permit uh, by the Zoning Board of Adjustment. And in talking with Chair Stevens, I think one of the reasons that Waterbury reversed themselves is that they looked at what Act 47 meant and they couldn't oppose it on those grounds. So um, hats off to all of you and to the next phase of permit work that will be tackling in the coming session, really important stuff. I do want to say, if you want to get, you know, I get a lot of time with all of you, and if you want to get me out of the chair quickly, then 
say the word and because uh, I, I get to come back. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. And, and this day really is about sort of hearing the the whole scope and we want to make sure we have plenty of time for uh, people with lived experience. So um, as you said, you'll be presenting in our committee. You've already presented in um, Chair Stevens committee. So um, it'd be great for you to uh, move through and we're going to um, for my committee, at least we're going to hold any questions um, for Gus until he uh, comes to our committee for testimony a little bit later this session. And um, Gus, I, I could ask you if you could um, speak up just a little bit because people are sitting sort of off to the side and I want to make sure that everybody can hear if you wouldn't mind. Uh, so just briefly, this is the accomplishment that's been made so far across the pandemic. Uh, these numbers come to us from the Agency of Human Services. Uh, this is at a scale not like anything that we've ever seen before. And again, I just want to add, clearly not enough. So many Vermonters still in motels. Um, you saw this picture at the uh, presentation pre-session. And its main purpose, which I will not dwell on, is to say that people are going in and out of homelessness. It's not that it's the same static population, but that people continue to find themselves unhoused for a variety of different reasons. Um, this is the slide on housing production over the decades. Um, and I do want to just uh, take a quick moment to say there, there are a number of different solutions that I see, and one of them is just to integrate folks into our general housing market as fast as we can. There is also something we call purpose-built housing, and one of them is what we call permanent supportive housing. And so the upper building is behind COT's existing family shelter. It will open any week now in Burlington uh, as permanent supportive housing, which is a different model for people who, they don't have to stay there rest of their lives, but they're able to and with supports. Um, and the way they got this site is an interesting one, and it just goes to the power of permanent affordability, which is the building in front was one we helped the Y by in the early 90s. And a decade later, they'd forgotten about that it was permanently affordable housing. They didn't have a need for it anymore. They wanted to start a capital campaign. They said, oh, we've got an asset on Main Street in Burlington. We're going to sell it for $800,000. And Rita Markley wanted desperately to buy it. And she called and said, we're going to give you an application. And here's the price. And we said, that's way too much. This is restricted to permanent affordable housing. And because of that covenant, she was able to get it for a much lower price and recycle it as housing, uh, as a family shelter. Um, this is a slide you've seen, but to go over it just precisely where we are so far with rental housing, and we do other things like farm worker housing, uh, home ownership, um, housing for people with disabilities through the Vermont Center for Independent Living. But on the rental housing, since the pandemic, we've invested $218 million. We've leveraged another almost $400 million invested in about 1,900 units, 1,620 are new. Almost half of them were online by the end of uh, 23, four or 500 coming online in 24, and the balance in 25, so significant. And of the 1,620 new <laughs> units, just about a third, a little over a third are for households experiencing homelessness. Uh, and then last, the people we work with uh, on a regular basis are now up to a quarter of their portfolio housing people who previously had been on hand. Um, and you asked in, in the budget uh, bill that we target 40% this year, 30% this year, and the providers we've worked with are actually at 40% for units that have become available since July 1. And over the course of the pandemic, and I think this is another value to having this permanently affordable inventory, they've taken 1,000 households who had been unhoused into that portfolio, which would not have been the case with the old federal style of 15 years or 20 years of affordability, and then you could sell the property for market value. Um, I'm not gonna dwell here 
a lot, but just two projects recently opened this year. One is in Bellows Falls, a former garage, cement block garage on Main Street. It was a dilapidated structure that is now 27 units, really nice apartments. And then a new neighborhood in South Burlington, um, I, um, also funded by us. And we will bring to our board next week uh, this building owned by Washington County Mental Health um, here in Montpelier that will become 24 apartments for people who have been <coughs> unhoused. Um, you asked us to focus on uh, uh, infills in mobile home parks. There is a, and we, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, with Chair Wood have been able to fund 13 units so far. I expect about three more specifically for folks that are unhoused, another 16 infills, not with the special funding that you set aside for that purpose will also take place again for, for very low and very low income families. And there's a new product available called a zero energy ready uh, mobile home. Uh, they're coming out of a factory in New York. The, the feds have changed the standards to create this certification. Uh, so it's a little bit more expensive, but not a lot, but for those of you who are interested in our climate impacts, um, it'll have a very positive impact. Um, hotels to housing. Uh, you heard a lot about the Oregon model. Um, when I talked with my friends, colleagues in Oregon, they had done 18 <laughs> hotel conversions to housing. We had already done 12. We just didn't label it. Um, but on a per capita basis, we are right up there. We'll, with, with Oregon uh, and in fact exceed them. Um, um, Rainbow Apartments, uh, two of these have been done by the Champlain Housing Trust. They have been heroic in their work over this time. Um, Rainbow Apartments was an isolation facility for people with COVID uh, during the pandemic. It's been converted again to 20 units of housing um, now. Um, Quality Inn is a project we'd like to have happen, um, and we're, there's been a long negotiation with the owner, not complete yet. And that's the way real estate goes, is sometimes you can make a deal and sometimes you can't. And I can talk a little bit more about the Chalet and the Champlain Inn if I'm allowed. A lot of investment in shelter, and over the years we've invested, I think, in every shelter in the state, um, one way or another. Um, but here in central Vermont, we added 50 beds, uh, 35 at the old motel on the Barry Montpelier Road. And then we had a facility that DC, uh, excuse me, Corrections no longer contract with Phoenix House for and added 15 beds in South Barry. Again, not enough, but 50 new beds <coughs> over the course of the pandemic here in central Vermont. Helped the Groundworks Collaborative with their facility uh, in Brattleboro, which uh, provides both kind of day station, but also 20 winter beds and the uh, organization working with survivors of domestic violence tripled their capacity, again, with the support of the Champlain Housing Trust in Colchester. Um, an issue for us, because we are on the capital side, our role is to make grants to do physical properties. We are not the experts on human services by any means, is that service providers in some cases have been overwhelmed. I had a conversation a few weeks ago with the director of the Homeless Prevention Center in Rutland, and I said, you know, we really need a facility, and we work with you on one. And he said, Gus, right now, I just cannot hire the staff that would staff it adequately. Um, Groundworks, um, even before the tragedy that took place at Morningside, had been the partner at the Chalet in West Brattleboro. And um, one week in the summer uh, before that murder, um, three of their employees just Quick. Uh, it was just really hard work. The impact of the chalet on the West Brattleboro neighborhood has been really difficult for the owner of the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, caused reputational harm, uh, which has slowed a development that they're working on in Putney because on social media you'll read Wyndham Windsor equals drug trafficking, all those kinds of issues. So uh, Again, in a conversation I had with Chair Wood yesterday, I don't know what the rights maximum size is. We've done really well with facilities of 20 or less. Um, we've been in the 35 and above 
people have had real difficulty operating those facilities. Um, Faith based group called a new operator the Champlain Inn. They came for two years again. <clears throat> the C coronavirus relief fund project that had where the money had to be spent in nine months. They sprinted, we sprinted, they got help from Cathedral Square to acquire the facility. Um, but it, it was not a success for them. They couldn't staff it, particularly after Burlington opened the pods. They felt they lost staff to a different provider. Um, and they wanted to just convert it to something else. And they said, no, nope. you agreed to permit restrictions and they have now after several months of difficult negotiation, transferred the property at no cost to the Champlain Housing Trust, which was willing to take it on if CBOEO would operate it. And they've agreed to do that two or three years. They have a similar partnership with Tim's Place up in St. Albans, where, again, a local group maintained Tim's Place and they've stepped in. So building that capacity at the social service end is one of all of our challenges. On the nuts and bolts construction side, we have made a technical assistance award to a statewide group called Evernorth to provide help to organizations that don't have to do real estate development, uh, to do construction management. Um, we're in discussion right now uh, with Morning Groundworks about replacement of the Morningside facility where the murder took place and, and they'll be helping them they helped stand up a facility in Rutland um, in the old John Deere dealership that's transitional housing as well as the you know, course of the pandemic. So we are trying to find ways for technical assistance. Thank, thank Gus. I, it would be good if we can, um, you know, sort of uh, wrap, wrap, wrap things up so we can. Um, I'm just going to uh, say two things. One is Beacon Apartments is a, again, another supportive housing development. This was done with the support of the medical center. This is old data, but the data tells us that people's health care costs went down pretty dramatically um, once they were housed as opposed to before they were housed. So while it's very difficult to find dollars to support people in permanent supportive housing, um, I guess what I would say to all of you as you think about the equation, whether it's in our health care budget or our corrections budget or our mental health budget, we're going to ultimately spend those dollars if we don't solve this problem. And so I think that it's worthy of more investment. And with that, I'm going to say thank you. And I appreciate the cue. And the purpose is for you to hear people other than me. And I look forward to working with you to continue to make progress on this really critical important issue that um, strikes all of us as staying on what we want for Mont to be. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Gus. Appreciate <clears throat> appreciate you being here and appreciate the work that you're doing in collaboration with so many partners across the state. Um, next up on our list, we have Ken Russell, who is the executive director of Another Way Inc. here in Montpelier. And while Ken is coming forward, just want to remind everybody that there is a day long. Um, schedule of events related to Homelessness Awareness Day. Uh, after this, there will be a vigil on the front steps as there has been in every year that's not been a COVID year. And then there will be some events later on this afternoon and that schedule is available in the State House. So um, make sure you can stop in and see or um, participate in the vigil uh, on, the, on the steps at, at lunchtime. Um, with that, welcome, Ken. Good to see you again. See you. Microphone is yours. Thank you. There's no microphone. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. My name is Ken Russell. Um, I'm the executive director of Another Way. Um, Another Way is a drop in center for folks with psychiatric disabilities or an alternative to medical model for psychiatric care. Uh, we have a long, proud 40 year history. Uh, we're across town. You might see us if you're going to the co op, you see the place with the greenhouse. Um, and we have a We've had a lot of great support from many sources over the years. We're funded by DMH. Over the years, we've dealt with a lot of unhoused people and it takes a toll. Um, we um, have a model, I mean, every day it, it can be heart-wrenching and it can be beautiful. Um, I would like to say that we deal with the people who are falling through the cracks in the system and we meet them. Um, 
And it's hard. It's hard on staff. It's hard for the folks who are living outdoors. Um, we most recently had a gentleman, and he, he said it's okay to talk about his story, who lost his leg um, trying to jump through a train by shots across town. And he has um, some behavioral issues, and he keeps flunking out of various uh, places. And so we're sitting there at the end of the day, figuring out where he's going to go that night. Guy in a wheelchair. So one night, I said one night only, because I have to think about liability, and set up a tent on our porch. It's like, where, where is the most physically safe place he can be right now? Um, and talk to some board members, talk to staff, you know, we'd like, this was a moral choice. Um, the next day we do what we often do is we, we engage with a whole network of, of people, really good hearted people, service providers, uh, folks working for AHS, different capacities, church volunteers, synagogue volunteers, and um, and one way or another, we, they get into somewhere. What we did this with this guy for six days, another way, bought him a room at the Comfort Inn at 200 bucks a pop using donor money. Um, City of Montpelier used to have a fund that Good Sam administered that would buy motel rooms. Connell Lodge, Hilltop are no longer offering rooms. There's been a change in ownership. Um, since I have this opportunity, I'll say it. Oh, I heard Gus talking about motel conversions. I guess that's the right way to say it. I was like, why didn't they do eminent domain and run these things properly? Why did they burn through so many tens of thousands or millions of, what are, you know the numbers. Um, who knows? But, but you need physical plant for folks. Um, so we deal with folks but meanwhile, so there are these big housing issues that I'm counting on all you to figure out. And, and I'm, the, I'm, I'm way off script. Um, <laughs> um, but we're dealing with folks who are somehow keeping it together. Um, they're staring at the abyss. They're, they are in existential crisis, like not like a liberal arts kid sitting on a hillside somewhere. They're like really in crisis. And, um, and we have a great staff and people are motivated. I mean, there's a reciprocity in this. People show up, you know, it's a struggle and there's something really freaking amazing knowing that everything we're doing is making a difference for folks who show up at our doorstep. People are really grateful and there's a lot of mutual care and that's gotta be one of the, you know, design principles of solutions is, re is recognizing that people really, really do care about each other. That's part of the peer support work is, is mutual care. And, you know, it's like you have, you have the government, you have the bureaucracies that each follow the imperatives they need to follow. And you have the ground up, you have people on the ground taking care of each other. The, the, the people from the faith community who bring meals day after day. Oh, well, one of the solutions for this guy in the wheelchair was, was that cold night. It's going to be eight degrees, and I was getting ready to be a, a, a hard ass and say, we can't do this another night. And the UU church said, we're going to open up a cold shelter with two 70-plus-year-old volunteers um, who are spending through the night. But there's, there's risks. I, I like to say there's – yeah, we have to be adult on both sides of this, and this has to do with the sort of the stigma – peace. We have to be compassionate. We, we have to not, we have to put in context the situation people are in there, but for the grace of God, go I. Like, what would you do if you were living outside all winter? Yeah, I'd be drinking or whatever. And then, but there are also some really rough edges. There's some really dangerous behavior. Yesterday, uh, two days ago, I exited six people for behavior that seem to stem from uh, opiate um, addiction. Dangerous stuff, like leaving, putting needles in somebody's locker. I showed up there, oh, there's a tent on the porch and there's a bunch of needles on the ground. There's a, a, a couple 
having sex in the bathroom on, you know, presumably high, breaking the bathroom, hurting themselves. My, we had a staff meeting yesterday about my decision to exit a bunch of people. And, 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 I, and, I, and I feel like I've, over the years, I've had a lot of, I've learned more and more gravitas in dealing with, this, with the re responsibilities of my job. Like, and it's like, I talked to the lawyer, Karen Stackpole, she's a great lawyer. And, you know, she's like, it's like my adult self has to sink deeper and deeper into what, what the liabilities are for our organization. Something goes wrong, our organization loses its buildings. I get sued for whatever I have. You know, it's like, I, I have to put that out there. And then my staff is like, we can feed them out the door, right? I mean, and it's like, it's like, so this whole range of challenges, I know I'm up to three or five minutes. I really appreciate the work you all are doing. Um, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you for the work that you're doing um, with, <clears throat> with everything that you've described. I mean, we're honored really to, to hear you and to hear our following witnesses too, but just to know that um, <clears throat> it takes a toll and um, we thank you for your service and your and your staying with it. You've been here for you've been coming back and back and back. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Sure. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Jess Graff. Morning, everyone. Morning, welcome. And um, the floor is all yours. Thank you. For the record, my name is Jess Graff. I live in Fletcher, Vermont, and I am the director of Franklin Grand Isle Community Action, which is a program of CGOEO, the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. I also serve as co chair to the Balance of State Continuum of Care, and I am a member of the board of the Housing and Homelessness Alliance of Vermont. We really appreciate your time. Um, and Franklin Grandal Community Action, among many programs, it's one of the three community action programs of CBOEO. And among the many things that we do, um, we, we administer HOP funding, Housing Opportunity Program funding, which prevents homelessness and resolves homelessness. Um, prevents it through rental arrearages and resolves it through security deposits. Uh, we also have, um, we're the lead agency for coordinated entry and we have programs that have staff on site at motels providing housing navigation and case management. And we also have staff that run community outreach programs um, and spend time in encampments weekly and to do outreach to people who are unsheltered and unhoused. Um, and one of the legislative priorities that is shared by CBOEO, as well as the Housing and Homelessness Alliance of Vermont, is to build services to meet the emergency shelter needs of Vermonters. And today, I'm going to present to you some information from Coordinated Entry, which um, uses our Homelessness Management Information System, or HMIS. Um, and we've collected some statewide data to just be able to do a, a little bit of level setting uh, around what we saw in 2023. And I hope it can illustrate both the current need as well as the success of the systems of support that we have in place. Um, in 2023, there were 4,952 households enrolled in coordinated entry, which was a total of 8,138 individuals. That included 6,019 adults and 2,108 children, as well as 563 youth, which is defined as individuals between the ages of 18 and 24, and 422 seniors, um, which is persons age 65 um, plus, and 276 veterans. Um, homelessness is complex, and there's not one face of homelessness. Um, we have a lot of single individuals who are struggling with developmental disabilities and mental health issues. But in Franklin County, in the last three years that I've served in my role, I've also served 
two individuals who made six figures um, and were uh, men after divorce uh, and living in their car while they were um, working full time and looking desperately for a rental or even a home purchase. Uh, and so the complex level of, of need and um, a huge variety of support that we have to um, be able to be prepared to offer people and varies person by person. But of those, uh, we do see some, some reoccurring sort of common themes and of those enrolled in coordinated entry um, in 2023, um, 3,508 attested to having a mental health disorder, 1,167 to having a developmental disability, 2,157 to having a physical disability, and another 1,850 to having a chronic health condition. It's important to note that um, those are not necessarily... It, different individuals, a person can attest to having potentially all three of those. But So overall, it is a, a really vulnerable population with complex needs. Yeah. It's also really important to note when we review coordinated entry data that these numbers are a baseline and they're always an undercount. Uh, they only represent people who knew about and chose to engage with the coordinated entry process. Uh, for the most part, it represents individuals who are staying in emergency shelter, uh, including Economic Services Division emergency housing programs. Uh, it often does not include many individuals who are served through our domestic and sexual violence shelters and programs. Uh, and historically, we often miss individuals who are unsheltered. That population is often hidden and isolated. And even with our teams that are working to do unsheltered outreach, we can struggle to locate people who are living in forests or in vehicles that they have to move often several times a day. Um, the unsheltered population has been really the hardest for us to feel like we have a solid count on. Um, and uh, we don't have great data to really guess how many individuals are experiencing unsheltered homelessness at any given time. But through the coordinated entry assessment, we do ask people where they stayed the night prior to the coordinated entry assessment. And of um, in 2023, 1,132 reported that they were living in a place not meant for human habitation on the night before uh, their coordinated entry assessment. For the most part, people are referred at the point where they enter shelter to coordinated entry, and we usually get to them within three days. That's always the goal, and across the state, we do a pretty good job of that. Uh, and so most people are already in shelter when we ask them that, and we don't have great data on uh, the unsheltered count, but that still seems like a really significant number to me to imagine um, that we have that many people who at some point during the year experienced unsheltered homelessness. Important to note that coordinated entry is a process and not a program. It's a process through which we connect people to services and resource, and it's a process that works. In 2023, 2,204 in individuals, or 64% of them enrolled in coordinated entry, exited into positive housing situations, including 1,144 with ongoing housing subsidies. <clears throat> housing subsidies are a critical tool for us in doing this work, as at any given time, about 67 to 70% of individuals enrolled in coordinated entry <clears throat> make under $1,000 a month in income. Housing people takes time and with limited resources and extremely limited available housing, most of those that were exited from coordinated entry in 2023 had been enrolled for between 90 days and two years. And the 4,618 people that remained in coordinated entry have been enrolled for more than a year. So about 24% of those that stayed within coordinated entry that we were unable to house or that didn't exit have been enrolled for more than a year. 
that's not necessarily a measure of the duration of their homelessness, as many of them might have been homeless multiple times in their lives or for several months before they were enrolled in coordinated entry. Although there is always room for improvement, through coordinated entry, we have a process that works for many. We have successes every day. And now more than ever, Vermonters are dedicated to working to build much needed housing. And we know, we know what works. We, you had a great presentation from Gus about what works. It's not the first time you've heard from Gus. You, you hear from Champlain Housing Trust and the home ownership centers across the state. We know what works. We have the solution. Uh, but the reality is that it's going to take us time to get there. And the unfortunate reality is, in the meantime, we need adequate emergency shelter. We appreciate the administration's commitment to increase the emergency shelter programs that's been presented, asking for, um, the, for the funding for the four additional emergency shelter programs. Um, homelessness response service providers agree that more emergency shelter is critically needed. However, we have great concerns about large and temporary shelter programs targeted at only those who qualified as part of the June cohort and ask instead for partnerships with other divisions within AHS, including the Department of Mental Health to take the lead on op opening smaller specialized emergency shelters that would provide services and support specific to people with identified needs, such as mental or developmental disabilities, or those struggling with chronic health conditions, including substance use disorders. These populations are often the most likely to struggle, to struggle in our current models. Um, and as you heard in testimony right before me, um, are often uh, most likely to end up unsheltered or in difficult situations where they're bouncing from shelter to shelter or different parts of the state as they're exited from motels and have to try to find new motels. We really think that there's a huge need for a model of shelter that is very focused on uh, sk with skilled staff on uh, providing treatment and support in addition to shelter. Uh, you have often been told that emergency shelters offer better services and supports than a motel program, but I want you to know that across the state, there are dozens of dedicated and skilled staff that work to ensure that people sheltering in motel rooms and encampments are supported in both meeting current needs and addressing housing solutions. Most of the motels across the state have staff that are on site daily that are really working in a holistic way to meet the needs of individuals and connect them to resources um, that uh, address medical care, vocational support, accessing food, uh, treatment services, and so much more. Although there is always room for improvement, the programs that provide emergency shelter, including motel rooms, are critical to thousands of Vermonters. And it's not an exaggeration to say that they save lives. And today we have testimony from those with lived experience will, that will share their stories of accessing emergency shelter programs. And we hope that you will hold their stories in your hearts as you make the difficult decisions over the session about the future of these programs. Thank you very much, Thanks. Jess. Appreciate, appreciate. Um, what you do every day, uh, as as well as you being here today to um, both uh, tell us about challenges, but also give us hope that there are ways to address those challenges as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your text. Thanks, Jetson. For any witnesses who have um, electronic copies or want to share the copies of their testimony, please feel free to forward them on to either Lori Morse or to Ron Wild, the committee assistants of the two committees um, so that we can keep it on record, especially something with numbers. Um, that would be, that would be great for us to have those updated numbers in our conversation. 
Um, we're going to start a run of witnesses of uh, folks with um, what we call lived experience. Um, and the first one we have on our list is John Medeiros, who is a veteran. And if you don't have the electronic copies, please feel free to leave the hard copies behind as well. Welcome, John. My name is Heinz John Medeiros. I'm 62 years old. My friends call me John because that's my middle name. I'd like you all to be my friends and call me John. I have an interesting uh, opportunity here this morning to thank nice people like you that have consideration for other people to not be hard hearted and say thank you. Thank you for your efforts and the things that you have to put up with from some people that may not feel the same uh, to, to persevere towards the outcome of us all living happily ever after. Um, a person that suffers from ADHD, I have uh, since I was a young child. I was one of them kids that was put in a, a, a desk with the sides on it so that I don't know if it was so that the other kids couldn't distract me or that I couldn't distract them. <laughs> Psychic or psycho, you make the choice. <laughs> Again, thank you. <laughs> I have to uh, write things down and have a thing that kind of I go on, you know, so that I can kind of stay on track. Uh, another thing that's been very helpful to me uh, is I get my medical care from the VA hospital because I'm a veteran, a Navy veteran, you know, because I was one of them kids that raised my hand and said pledge of allegiance and then became a Boy Scout. And then became a man scout. <laughs> and I and I serve my country like you all do in your own special way. Even the ones that stay at home, you know, love America, um, and do their part. So I'll, I'll I'll do this thing. I'm here. I introduce myself. Number one, I don't do this very often, and you all are in for a special treat because you get to actually meet the type of person that you are, are, are working for, you know what I mean? And in the end, it comes out to be a happy ever after story. So, you know, you're gonna feel really happy. It's <laughs> <laughs> gonna be great, I guarantee it. <laughs> um, I'm here to represent homeless veterans. And I'd like to share a little of my story with you. So, <clears throat> When the pandemic hit, see, I'm kind of a, a, a personable person. You know, when I'm clean and I'm shaved, you probably wouldn't know I was a homeless person because I'd be that guy over there at McDonald's on my laptop. You know what I mean? Laughing to myself with my headphones on, doing something God only knows what. Um, the police were not called. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings me to another good point, too. Lucky for me, after I got out of the Navy, which I participated in alcoholism, 100%, uh, you know what I mean? On the base, we had we had machines that you could put 75 cents in and a beer came out. I mean, you know, you go to do your laundry and there's like a, a, a gallon of alcohol that somebody else has had there already and we were also drunk. Hi. Um, <clears throat> But lucky for me, I was able to go into the AA program at 27 years old. And now that I'm 62, I've enjoyed all these years of not having the obsessive problems with choices over alcohol. So my body, as far as the liver, whatever, you know, thank God it's not hurt. But I unfortunately do have an addiction and that is smoking. That I, I, out of all the things that I've let, I, you know, I've never tried the opiates. You know, I'm, I'm 62. I'm not really in that hip generation, which I'll get to later, which when it has something to do with the environment of homelessness, considering here we are in our 
2024, <clears throat> as opposed to the 80s when I first became a vagabond and, and, and saw America. Like the sign on Interstate 80 that says the highest point on Interstate 80 or the old Las Vegas or, you know, different things like asking the people that are Native American that I'm riding with in their car, why do they call this the painted desert? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because flowers grow there at a certain time of year, I guess. Um, interesting that, you know, I took my tours of the country while I was at a young age and could enjoy it. And it's probably a good thing that I did because now that I'm 62, I don't have the money for that kind of stuff. And I suffer from severe COPD. So I, I don't get to really walk as far as I used to, which is a very important part of homelessness is being able to walk around and, and not be like part of the pack that looks weak. You know what I mean? So thank God things worked out for me the way they did. Um, when the pandemic hit, a lot of the businesses and other resources like the coffee shop and the McDonald's and, 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 the, and, the, and the kitchen that you go to to eat dinner and socialize and, and um, make um, connections. Uh, there's a word for that I can't think of. Um, all that closed down. Everybody was really afraid of each other. And me with COPD and, and a transmission rate of 20, excuse me, 25%. I was scared to death. You know, I was wondering who was going to get my laptop and, and who was going to see what was on it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I called the, the 800 number for uh, homeless people that were, uh, you know, and then I got put into the Comfort Inn in White River Junction, Vermont. And I'll tell you, when I walked in there, they looked at me like one of those homeless people. Wonder what kind of drugs or trouble this person is going to start. By the time I walked out of there a year later, thank you all very much for paying all that money, because um, I sure did enjoy it, a room at the Comfort Inn. I made the very best of it. I took it very seriously, as if I was in a, uh, like a, a pandemic. You see, I wasn't going to die of a pandemic because I wanted to go hang out with my friends or think this was some kind of vacation resort. You know, I'm a soldier. I, I take things very seriously. So um, I took advantage of the money that was given for my housing from the Vermont, like the uh, um, social welfare people. I called the number, they paid my rent. I held my breath every 30 days and wonder if they were gonna do it again. And that became kind of a little bit of a mental problem, but I talked about it with my psychiatrist over there at the VA and we got it all worked out and it did, it all worked out as you'll see towards the end of the story. I'm sorry if I go over three, five minutes, but I think, I think it's very important for all of us to you all in a suit, you know what I mean? You have a white shirt on. You know what I would do to a white shirt? <laughs> that we were able to, you know, communicate you and somebody like me, us, you know, in the big melting pot. So uh, I couldn't go to the coffee shop. I couldn't go here, couldn't go there. Called the 800 number. I heard that they would get you off the street. And sure enough, they sure did. And they were very patient with me and, and very kind to me. Like I sometimes had to talk to a person that was like in charge of the, of the um, White River office. And she was a nice lady. I can't remember her name. I'm really sorry about that. Somebody like you guys, I'm sure. And thank you again. Um, and, you know, didn't talk down to me or anything. And just, you know, I guess it wasn't her, her money. So they paid and paid. I think it was $3,000 a month. I had a king size bed, internet, air conditioning, electricity. And believe me, I know how to use those things. <laughs> Hot shower. You have no idea how amazing it is to have running water. You ever have to carry water? You ever try to carry water in a five-gallon bucket? And then it all sloshes on your leg? God help you if you had to go up a hill. Anyways, running water. Instant on lighting. <laughs> <laughs> I 
with that. So then I made it, I, and then I, unfortunately, since I live on inhalers and very expensive inhalers, come to find out, um, I called the 800 number for medical needs to uh, the VA hospital. And that's the first time I ever wanted to have anything to do with them people, because you know what Navy means? It means never again volunteer yourself. You stay the hell away from them people. They talked to it the first time. Yeah. Get out of there. Stay out of there. Oh, the thing I wanted to add is not only have I quit drinking at a very young age, but I haven't had any problems with the law. I'm not a felon. I'm not addicted to hard drugs. Once in a while, I enjoy the legalized marijuana. That was a really good idea, but unfortunately, what people don't realize is that smoking causes COPD. So, you know, every silver cloud has a rainy side, I guess. <clears throat> so, anyways, not a hard drug user, not a felon, not a child molester. And through all this vagabondness, I never ended up getting in serious trouble, like stealing a car or robbing somebody or, or any of that stuff, which, you know, some people might have bad choice making and do considering their, you know, addictions, especially addictions. And that's something I want to talk about as far as the new uh, socialization of homeless people, the type of homeless people. Um, different than in the 80s. <clears throat> so I called the VA. They gave me my inhalers. They were really cool about it, too. And I'm telling you, these are really expensive inhalers. And God knows that I am addicted to those because they, they keep me alive. Um, and even with the inhalers, you know, I, I still am having a downward uh, spiral towards my health but my mind is sharp. <laughs> I'm a New Englander. You know, I, mean, I can make stuff. But the ADHD kind of slows me down a little bit. So when I got out of the Navy, uh, with the ADHD, you know, I was the perfect butterfly. You know, I just went vagabonding and, and just saw things and, and just had a really nice time. So I got into the HUD batch program at the VA. And then I was able to have help because I have problems filling out forms. Um, I read really well, but I don't write things very well. Like being an ADHD person, I never really caught on like sentence structure. You know what I mean? You know, I've been putting periods on the end of what I think is a sentence. And I hope, I hope it makes sense. <laughs> so I got on the Social Security, got a big check, and I was really careful with it. It didn't, and I'm happy to say that in my case, the big check to me was a lot of money. As a person that you know lived on the gratitude of of, of others, uh, you know, caring, um, and I got on the food stamps. And then something I get on the HUD VAT program. I get my health care, physical and mental health from the VA hospital. Uh, my caseworker helped me to apply for housing and to find an apartment in Springfield, Vermont. I live at 6B Reservoir Road in Springfield, Vermont. Y'all are welcome to write to me, send me your business card if you want to ask me questions after this. I'm open to that. I know a lot about this. You guys have like an interesting person to talk to, you know? Yeah. Um, this is my first apartment in 10 years. I, I, I really enjoy being outside and living in nature. Like, for instance, at different times of the year, when you're out there, you can see when the grass starts growing. Or when the trees change and the and the leaves change and certain kinds of birds come through at certain times of the year and skunks and and just all these things that happen that you know people that drive in cars probably don't really notice. <clears throat> and the old man against nature thing. I have I, I have uh, sleeping bags 
that were donated to me, like the one similar to the ones that you would go camping on Mount Everest with. And I would put one inside the other and some other uh, things to keep me warm because I even enjoyed camping in the winter. You know, but when it gets less than 18 degrees, I, I have to decide, you know, whether it's freedom to go outside and sleep outside in the winter or insanity to make that choice. And lucky for me being sober, when I made that choice, it worked out so far. <clears throat> but my health and my age prevents me from living that lifestyle now. In April 2021, I moved into my new apartment. And, uh, you know, being a person that didn't ever have an apartment in 10 years and no, like, um, um, reference in any normal amount, you know, and no credit rating and all that stuff that a homeless person doesn't have. They were like, who are you? We've never heard of you before. <laughs> They'd be like, that's the way I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, they wanted me to qualify for being homeless by having a record of homelessness. I'm going to have a record of homelessness when I'm hiding in the woods. <laughs> that's a rule that's very unusual. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, I can't prove homelessness. It's true. Well, they said you could have a police officer say that you were homeless. Or you could have a person this and that and the other thing that said you're homeless. I don't have contact with police officers. I mind my business and I keep my hands to myself, just like my mom told me to. <laughs> Since then, I have lived in my apartment, which is beautiful. It was like a miracle. So then when I do want an apartment, all this other stuff works out for me. The apartment that I moved into on the first floor, walk in, I can roll my electric bike right through the door. I do carry insurance case the electric bike burns down the house. So. <laughs> anyway, so in two and a half years, the electric bike has not burned down the house and I put 600 miles on it. And the best thing about that, my rent includes electricity. <laughs> That's the kind of place you want to get. You know, your car with that, your building having electricity included, then you make it money. <laughs> I lived there for two and a half years. Oh, the apartment. So before I moved into the apartment, I guess it was kind of a dump. And then the landlord got some kind of a loan from somebody, like the government or the state, I don't know, but you know, it's all about loans and 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 so. They took everything out of the apartment, all the walls, all the drywall, everything, and redid everything in the entire apartment. It looks like a condominium. It has all stainless steel appliances, which I keep shiny because I have stainless steel cleaner and I know how to use it. I did mention I was a soldier. Uh, I take a lot of pride in how I make the carpet. Looks like I did when I moved in two and a half years ago. You know why? Because I bought a brand new vacuum cleaner to use on my brand new carpet. And I clean my vacuum cleaner. Like I take it apart and actually clean it because you can't clean a floor with a dirty appliance. <laughs> it's all about cleaning to the corner. <laughs> uh, I continue to pay my rent on time. I lived there for two and a half years. I pay my rent before it's due. Like one time it was Christmas and I emailed my landlord just to keep in contact, say, hi, how are you doing? I just wanted to say, I hope you have a really nice day and things are going really well here to keep that communication open. That way, if anything should ever happen, they'd be like, oh, well, that's John Medeiros. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I wrote to him one time, it was Christmas time. And I'm like, you know, I really appreciate this. And I just was trying to think of something to do nice for you for Christmas, you know? I said, I'm going to pay my rent early. I paid my rent two weeks before I went to you. <laughs> uh, I just wanted everyone to know how much I pre appreciate what everyone has done for me and that any money spent on me has been well spent. So I was telling you about that I got all that money and I didn't end up uh, using it on cocaine and ores. You know, 
So, uh, or end up with it back in my drinking problem or call up the ex-wife and ask her if she wants to get back together. You know what I mean? Any stupid things like that. <laughs> but because I have a post-traumatic stress because of this experience, I do things like, yeah, I bought Coleman lanterns. You know, the kind that you put the Coleman fuel in and pump it up like that. I have three of them. I have uh, backup power supplies, like I wished I'd had back in my tent. Uh, I bought one. Um, I didn't like the way it worked out. I went to uh, vocational school for electronics when I was in high school. And so I know a little bit about manufacturing things. And I didn't like the backup battery lithium ion phosphate battery that I bought uh, pre-made from the, from the um, factory, which came from eBay and it didn't even turn on. So I wrote to them, I said, don't you guys test these things before you send them out? So since I didn't like that, I built my own. <laughs> it's wicked cool. <laughs> and I feel like I can rely on it. Um, similar to buying a fire extinguisher in the case of emergency, I have allocated some of my resources to preparing for the worst case scenario of this beautiful dream that I live, uh, that I live disappearing. I've used some of my money to prepare for that. This is why it is so important that our government continues to provide assistance and funding to the HUD Bash program and other programs like that. So that's me. And you want to ask me a question? We're just about at five minutes, John. How <laughs> <laughs> more times in your lifetime that you're going to have a chance to be able to ask a person like me in this type of environment a question? No one has a question for me? I think you were pretty thorough, John. That's, and I appreciate you giving us your address. I wrote it down. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, it's, um, I actually wanted to applaud for you, <laughs> you know, at the, at the end of your presentation. Um, uh, you know, just because one, I, I personally appreciate your resilience and sharing, you know, your story, the way you've shared it and, and the things that have worked great for you and the things that like, you know, you're still working through like your, your post-traumatic stress and, and feeling like, you know, at any moment, this, as you said, this dream that you're living might, might be yanked out from under you. And I, I think that's really important for us to hear. Yeah. It's all about the funding. You know, I get the, I get the discounted, uh, uh, uh rent payments because of you guys. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And I've been very careful. And I just wanted to tell you all that, at least in this case, your money was well spent. Because unfortunately, what happens is some vagabond type people, travelers, uh, wandering souls, people that have a traveling bone, is you get them into a nice place and you seem like that. And it would seem like that would be like, all they could ever want. And they flitter off like an alcoholic taking his next drink after promising not to drink again. It's because some people just aren't ready to settle down. So when the time comes that a person does settle down and uses the money wisely, then I think that's an example of why we have to keep trying. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I would just add, John, as you're sitting down to say, it's good to hear this part of the story that there are successes. We hear so much, especially every January, how much more we have to do as if what we've been doing hasn't been working. And I keep sharing the story of where it worked. Thank you. And thanks for coming up all this way. <laughs> it's a long it's long Hopefully um, not on the electric bike. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine, I don't want to... Frazine? Frazine? Oh, she... I, I, I was very excited and has not been... Her phone isn't off for... Which is sometimes what happens. Okay. Um. So I 
have her testimony, but without her, without being able to communicate with her, I don't want to give it to you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you're able to reach her um, before yeah. we end the hearing, then we'll yeah. certainly hear it. Okay. okay. And if it can be submitted. Um, yeah. Yeah. Her permission, Ask permission. Yeah. Um, so Rube's Gold, it looks like you are um, on the screen. Are you available? Hi. Oh, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. And the floor is yours to share what it is that you'd like to share with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, for the record, my name is Rube Gould. Um, I was asked to share my experience with homelessness today. Uh, homelessness is obviously very difficult. It's draining and confusing, and it makes people lose faith in humanity. Um, there are a lot of hoops to jump through just to have shelter, and I'd like to assume that everyone here is in agreement that shelter is a basic human right. So I'm left wondering why it's such a struggle and why we as a species can't meet people at this basic need. Um, why does something so ingrained in our species have to be so complicated? Um, it's painful to summarize my experience in a short segment, but I think it's important to help people understand that the homeless find themselves in dangerous or difficult situations uh, all the time. And Many of these dangers are things people are experiencing for the first time. Um, just several examples that I've dealt with personally is being caught up in fights that break out from seemingly nowhere, um, not having access to medicine when I was sick, sleeping outside in illegal areas when I had no other options, being told a shelter is at capacity and I won't get a bed after carrying all of my belongings all day. Um, organizations or programs losing my housing paperwork or just generally not being very communicative, probably from a lot of work overload, I would imagine. Uh, not having anything to eat for dinner is just kind of a gimme. Uh, losing friendships and not knowing how I could have been better is probably the hardest thing that the homeless deal with. Um, people yelled rude expletives at me and threw trash at me from their car and told me to just get a job when I wake up, wake up every morning cold and wet and dirty. And a lot of shelters will say that we can't have a beer after dealing with all of this all day and all week dealing with feeling like the world just hates us for existing. Um, so it's quite dehumanizing, you might say. Uh, the stigma is all around us and it's not going anywhere. So I really wonder how we can initiate change on that. Um, I'd like to mention an organization that's been extremely supportive of me this past year. Um, it's called Pathways Vermont Community Center. And I think they're doing a lot of things right. Um, and I'd love to see other programs emulate what they're doing. Uh, I never felt like I was a homeless person when I was at Pathways. I just felt like I was home. Um, the staff are extremely supportive and meet people where they're at. Um, they provide a safe space to feel whatever I was feeling at the time. Uh, and they build trust with the community and allow friends of the space to store food and use their kitchen so that they can have their hot meal, probably their only hot meal fresh with actual produce that they've had all week, uh, which meant a lot. Uh, it's also just a comfortable space to be. Um, a, a lot of like shelves and shelters just don't feel comfortable comfortable to be to be in for one reason or another, but Pathways is just built as a nice place for community. Um, this certainly isn't everything that Pathways offers, but it meant the most to me. Um, so I'd like to shout them out. 
the other shout out I'd like to mention is uh, nonprofit Food Not Cops. Um, yeah. Food Not Cops is an invaluable resource, uh, not just for food security, but also community. Um, there's never any stigma against the homeless at Food Not Cops, and uh, they help people meet their needs, whatever that may be. So if somebody needs a drink or needs a smoke, then they'll help us get that, which I think goes a long way. Um, the last thing I've been asked to weigh in on is what would have been more helpful to me while facing homelessness. And that's a, sort of a big question. Uh, the simplest answer is just, you know, shelter. Um, why do we make access to safe shelter so hard? I don't understand. Um, and if you ask my opinion, I'd say we should tear down the barriers we've created for people to meet their basic needs. Um, I think it would be helpful if wealthy individuals stopped profiting off of real estate. I'd like to mention that I'm still young. I'm in my 20s still. And just 11 years ago, when I was living in a two bedroom with my father, our rent was $800 a month. And today, the same two bedroom would easily be $3,000 a month. So if you're wondering why there's a housing crisis, I think there's your answer. Um, that's all I've written down. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. And um, I don't know if you heard um, Representative Stevens say, um, if you're willing to share uh, you know, what you have written down, it's always helpful for us to be able to go back and look and reread the testimony that people have given. And um, I um, very much, we very much appreciate the, the thoughts that you have about ways that we can try to make things better when you're going through um, not feeling like people are even treating you as a human being. And I think that's um, one of the most important things for us to take away from what you said, as well as uh, trying to, why do, why do things, and I, I think that um, John said this as well, why do things need to be so complicated? Um, you know, uh, and I, I think that's a, um, a real lesson for us as we look to try to make things better. So we we really very much appreciate you sharing your your story and your thoughts about how we can improve things today. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Next up on our list, we have Brian Plant. Yeah, yeah, other side there. And John moved the chair, so you can move it back. <laughs> Some of you might remember Brian from our, uh, on our side of the table, at least from our joint hearing um, with the Senate uh, earlier this year. So thanks for thanks for having me back. Some of the, for some of the folks, this might be a rehash, but there's some new faces that I haven't seen that will get the chance to hear it. Um, want well, to thanks Brenda and uh, Rep. McGill for helping coordinate getting me here today. I found out about this earlier in the week, but it didn't become official till like about five o'clock last night. So it's like scrambling to make it work. Good morning. Record, my name is Brian Plant II from Bristol, Vermont. I was born in Burlington, raised in Chittenden County. I graduated from Essex Junction High School. Then graduated with an associate's degree from Champlain College. I worked retail, home health care, as a contractor for the United States Immigration and Naturalization Service, and ultimately as an occupancy analyst for J.P. Morgan Chase. A son, a brother, an uncle, and a friend to many. A writer, an artist, a bit of a nerd, <laughs> and a novice youth leader. <clears throat> Late October 
2020 through mid-August 2021, I lived in the John Graham Shelter in Virginia. This was followed by two years transitional housing through the SRO program, which stands for Single Resident Occupant. And uh, Rhett McGill was my landlord at that place. <laughs> <laughs> We won't ask you how good of a landlord she was. That's another story, another committee. <laughs> you can talk to us. Right, yeah. Yeah. There's a small box that you can. Uh, <laughs> uh, I lived, there, lived there from August 2021 through September 2023. On September 1st, 2023, I successfully leased up in a newly built apartment in Bristol, the firehouse apartments for those that are familiar with. Um, at the time I entered the shelter, I believe that that was the lowest point in my life as well. Just prior to entering the shelter, uh, an acquaintance of a good friend of mine, familiar with the system, helped me start the mountain of paperwork required to acquire services. Uh, the plan prior to moving into the shelter was this acquaintance would run point, volunteering her time, and the shelter staff would provide support. Fortunately, that did not happen. After about a week, I was essentially ghosted. The paperwork that we had started was never submitted. Uh, so after going back and forth, um, we ended up wasting about two months of time before we actually got the paperwork resubmitted or you know, submitted for the first time, I guess. So began the process of, um, it also began the process of changing uh, service coordinators. If you count the initial advocate, I was, I'm now officially on number 11 in three years. This is not unique for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, around the same time, I began to try to access the federal government's Lifeline program for free cell service. Vermont is serviced by Q-Link. Uh, their actions forced me to go without a phone for months. While they couldn't help me, uh, when I didn't have coverage. It took about six months to resolve huge barrier to keeping up with appointments, whether it's doctors, um, appointments with government agencies, service coordinators, whatever, it's, it's, if you can't, unfortunately, phone is a necessity at this point. Uh, late January, early uh, February, 2021, was presented with the opportunity to participate in the single room occupancy slash SRO program, which provides a pathway to obtaining housing or housing choice section eight voucher. Uh, this would be my first experience with filling out VSHA paperwork. Uh, I was required to fill out a 20 page, 20 plus page application providing financial information as requested. Uh, in April, I was asked to refresh the financial information, which included filling out the application in full for a second time. Uh, about two months later, I heard back that I was accepted in the program. I can tell you that the lack of time frames and communication is problematic especially if you're suffering for something like mental, you know, mental illness or challenges. Um, you know, if you have the rough timeline, it helps, you know, if they say a couple months um, and that uh, you can reach out, but sometimes these indefinite things just gives the line time to walk. Once go by, it is easy for, you, for someone dealing with something like depression, for doubt, despair, and hopelessness to set in. The system has let us down many times before. Why wouldn't it? I said earlier that I thought moving into the shelter was the lowest point in my life. I was wrong. That would be August 25th, 2021. That was the day of my disability hearing and my move into the SRO. The hearing was grueling because your life is laid bare for people to sift through all the worst things about your life, confirming them while others are actively trying to deny you assistance. Uh, the experience nearly broke me. I was then unceremoniously moved to the SRO program, our pro unit, without contact from my support network for several days. Uh, these people I had depended on, knew how hard this was for me, knew my health, was, health and transport had transportation issues and how bad my health was, a limited ability to get around, thought I'd build connections with, and I was left to flounder for a few days. Uh, thankfully, I made it through the initial move period. I could go on about various programs that were supposed to help with one thing or another, for example, furniture, but fell short. I did receive uh, VRAP, the Vermont Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, I was fortunate with my decision in my, this, this my disability case. But with a favorable decision came losing benefits. 
It's fed to give us, and the state take it for it. I was able to keep Medicaid during the COVID emergency order. It helped greatly recover my many medical medications, counseling appointments, physical therapy, uh, and durable medical equipment. But with the rescinding of the order, I'm no longer eligible for Medicaid and have already begun to see the concerns that I had come to come to life. Uh, Co-pays for counseling and law enforcement to go less often. Additionally, in losing Medicaid, I'm no longer eligible for the uh, Lifeline phone program. Over the course of the next two years, while trying to get my life back on track, every few months it seems like some agency or another needed paperwork filled out. Someone actually needs to read through these questions because many are unclear, especially when a person is worried that one wrong answer can get them dropped from a program. With a long wait, uh, with a long wait, possibly get benefits restored. It strikes me confusing. So it strikes me that it's so confusing that even some of the service coordinators um, get the answers wrong or are stumped by them due to the lack of clarity. Um, this is also, this is even made worse by the unrealistic turnaround times. If, if I never see another 10 day required response request, it'll be too soon. That's received, not postmarked. The request often shows up four days late after the, after the date that it's printed by, which often gives a person 24 to 48 hours to gather the info and get it back in the mail to make sure it shows up on time. Server, service coordinators are rarely available to meet in such service and notice due to their caseloads. If multiple clients receive the same request, somebody gets left out. The fear, stress, the panic, and the anxiety that this invokes in many, many clients who struggle with mental illness echoes for days and weeks. Trust me, you have no, no idea how much damage this causes people. It's especially insulting when a request packet sits on the desk of somebody for weeks or months. It's not acceptable. I hope it's an area that somebody will get to. As stated earlier, we successfully housed as of September. My Section 8 voucher almost didn't get extended. Housing choice for the rest of you. Um, for those unfamiliar with the SRO program, a person accepted in the program spends one year in trans a transitional living space. At the end of one year, if they are in good standing, they become eligible for housing choice Section 8 voucher. Currently, it's the only clear path for many to receive assistance and be available in only limited spaces. At the end of my year, I was deemed no longer eligible for the subsidy at the locations I was living, but I could stay there paying full rent. Uh, the SHA would provide no assistance. I was also informed that I would have six months to use the voucher or lose it. In other words, I was treated like if I didn't find a place, I was doing something wrong, and that it might be possible to do a short extension. Anyone familiar with the housing situation knows how limited the supply is, how high the rents are, and how dire the situation truly is. I conducted my search with having very little success in the effort. In November 2022, VMI service coordinator, number nine for those who keep track, began to reach out to VSHA to make the extension process easier. The six month period was set to expire January 30th, 2023. We reached out five times before receiving a brief response asking who the request was for, even though my name was clearly provided multiple times. The holidays occurred to which, which we reached out five more times before the deadline. We reached out eight more times before getting a response in late March. In April, I received a letter telling me I was terminated from the program due to inactivity and I could appeal a, a, a people request an appeal. I requested the appeal only to follow, follow up with VHA to have them tell me they felt hearing was unnecessary unless my financial situation had changed. I then had to fire back that they kept dodging my questions that I had spent months trying to get answered, that they kept referencing stuff that I already knew, and that if a hearing was the only way to get heard, I demanded. VSHA reluctantly agreed to have the hearing. Prior to the hearing, I provided them with cell phone logs, date, time, phone number, and all email correspondence. About 15 minutes before the hearing, I received a cancellation notice for the hearing, along with an email with soft apology, reinstating me back into the program, 
them needing updated financials and yet another 20 plus page questionnaire application. I want to be clear, this is not an uncommon story. If I didn't keep fighting, <laughs> keep great records, I might not be housed today. How is someone going through their worst days facing challenges, whether it's substance, substance abuse disorder, trauma, or mental health roadblocks, if their service coordinators are not bringing their A game, going to get the help they need? Why are people who are experiencing this always held to a higher standard than the providers, state agencies, and others? They can miss deadlines, we cannot. They can lose paperwork, we cannot. Somehow I've made it through, minus a story of success. Unfortunately, the problem of homelessness is not going away, and it cannot be ignored. I returned to Montpelier today to try to finish bookending that chapter of my life and to give it some meaning while I figure out what comes next. Um, if able, I still like to return to some capacity to being a productive member of society. Since the last time I was here, I've conducted several interviews about my story with the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, Vermont Food Bank, Addison Housing Works, and I've submitted two letters of intent to join uh, board of directors for two, uh, two different organizations, um, likely later to be made official later uh, by mid year. Uh, additionally, I intend to help participate, intend to participate in the mental health awareness advocacy day on the 29th. I may even be back to testify in front of students. Some of you again, so you might get sick of me. Uh, I don't consider myself an advocate, but it's certainly a path that seems to be unfolding in front of me and I should choose to take it. I do hope by continuing to share my experiences that it lands in the ears of those who need to hear it. And instead of pulling up the ladder behind me, the process gets smoother and less painful for those that have nowhere to go. Um, two things I didn't add to the speech because I didn't have time to completely edit it. Um, BSHA still has problems with the disorganization. I recently received two letters from them. One um, telling me, congratulations, you've been accepted for the Section 8 housing, and this is how much money we're going to help with. I knew that five months ago. Why are you sending me this now to furnish? Do I need to respond? Do I need to fill out something? The second letter was telling me that they wanted updated financials for the tenant-based voucher, which I had not received you know, assistance from them since September um, 2022, and it kicked me out of in April of 2023. And then I had to fight to get back in to get my voucher back. So they're still disorganized. When I followed up with them asking what's going on, if I needed to send anything in, my field rep had no clue why I was sent this information. Um, it was then forwarded on to a couple of different other people who came back with, oops, we don't know why it gets sent to you. Um, sorry for the confusion. Again, I'm, I think I'm sharp. I figured it out, made it through, but other people would be panicking, I'll tell you that much. And if I leave with you guys with anything, I get to go home. When I'm done here today talking, I get to go home. There are all of us, I assume, you know, I'm just making an assumption here, get to go home, whether it's an apartment, a condo, whatever. There are a lot of people who still don't get to go home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Hey, um, next, guess who we're going to hear from? Vermont State Housing Authority. Heard of them? Yeah. <laughs> this will be uh, this will be both Caprice and Daniel. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Blackett with the Vermont State Housing Authority. Um, Unfortunate to hear that experience. Uh, we're going through a lot of challenges with staffing, like a lot of folks, and but still not acceptable. But um, I just want to thank John um, for his uh, highlighting his experiences with VASH, uh, which is a, another one of our programs. Um, that's one of my uh, points I'm making today is that uh, the VASH program is a federally funded program, meaning it pays for the subsidies and it pays for services. Um, however, um, at your request in 2019, we uh, presented on why we were unable to use some of our homeless funding uh, and had to subsequently turn it back uh, to HUD. And 
uh, one of the reasons is because uh, we have to have a map for that program. That's called the shelter risk care program. Uh, and um, the, the match at that time was about, we lost about 25 to 30% of the sun back. Uh, this last year, we had to send about 70% back uh, because we are not getting any applications. We don't have enough service providers uh, or capacity uh, in the area uh, or around the entire state. Uh, everyone in the shelter care program and suffer at, from chronic homelessness, meaning as a disabling condition and 12 months or more of literal homelessness. Uh, and every, everyone has some of the highest needs of any of our programs, uh, including corrections, experiences, criminal records, no income, uh, frequent stays in the motel programs, uh, victims of domestic sexual violence, substance use disorders, uh, and severe mental health issues, often exacerbated by homelessness itself. Uh, increasingly, people are older, 60 plus, um, and in the uh, actually very recent uh, uh, publication by HUD, they highlighted the Housing First program, um, and which uh, thankfully uh, the legislature approved an expansion of last year to uh, into Bennington County um, through Pathways Vermont, which is another speaker, um, and that's been our only. Uh, real viable uh, utilization of our funding is because they were able to serve people uh, with that extra services. Um, the um, their utilization compared to our uh, other program, they they've utilized fifty eight percent of their grant, so more than. The thirty percent we're at with our uh, original structural care grant, uh, and it's increasing every day. But it cannot; it's only increasing incrementally. But it could do a lot more good if it was expanded into another area, which they deemed uh, a high need area uh, in Rutland County, um, and uh, which is uh, they have twenty uh, percent of the homelessness of all. <laughs> Uh, of all homelessness in Vermont and 16% of all the chronic homelessness in Vermont. So uh, it is one of the highest needs area, but also one of the lowest services for permanent sort of housing, uh, which Gus also mentioned, uh, uh, I guess Cheney with the Homeless Prevention Center, who I work with as well, and other programs, uh, there is a lack of services uh, available. And also not just services in general, but uh, quality services. It requires a full complement of teams through the Pathways Housing First program to make sure that people are uh, consistently and successfully housed. Their success rate is 85% utilization, or it has been for years, which is very high for permanent sort of housing of this kind. So um, uh, that is pretty much what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, just Wondering if your colleague has anything that she wants to add. Well, Caprice is going to be talking about the manufactured home uh, program. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm hopeful that uh, I believe Molly sent my PowerPoint on that I will be sharing with the uh, committees today. First and foremost, my name is Caprice Hover. I work for the Vermont State Housing Authority and I'm their project, uh, special project manager. I have overseen VRAP, and now I oversee the Landlord Relief Program and the Mobile Home Improvement and Repair Program. These are critical new opportunities at Vermont State Housing Authority to help address these items that you are speaking of. I also want to take a moment to thank the uh, folks with lived experience who had a lot of courage and braveness coming to a room where there's usually generally pretty intimidating for folks. So thank you for sharing your stories. And as a former couch surfing teen, I can relate to the humility that comes with working with uh, folks that don't necessarily look at you as a human being. Um, unfortunately, it would look up here like the hosted is, I'm not able to share my screen. <laughs> um, if there's a way to change that, that would be great. 
We're happy on that. Thanks. Hold on. Thank you very much. I know you all have, while we're working on it, I know you all have a hard job to do, and I want to thank you for the challenges I, I've been advocating in Vermont around homelessness and housing support services my entire life. I believe that there are a complexity of folks. You've heard from me before that I've said that homelessness is hidden, and I think COVID opened the doors and really showed us the complexity of what folks have been working with on the ground level for a very long time. We've also created opportunities where if we could figure out how to do more of the hotel conversions like Gus spoke of, there are communities that have been established in these uh, hotels and those supports. And I was able to do a site visit in court at the Cortina in Rutland. And I saw many of my clients that I used to work with at Brandon Training School as well. So we have to understand that there is a level of complication and support that's needed that is going to be long term and it is expensive and it is hard to find social workers uh, to work at the levels of pay that they have been requested to. If somebody wants to give me a thumbs up when I'm ready, otherwise I can just it, it's like co-hosting. Yeah, you're okay. Super awesome. Thank you so very much. I'm very excited to be working in these programs. The uh, mobile home improvement. I've always believed mobile home projects are a source of of um, affordable housing for our state. So as I said, I'm with the Vermont State Housing Authority. Our uh, mission is to promote and expand the supply of affordable rental and homeownership opportunities on a statewide basis. Each new endeavor will enhance or increase the organization's capacity to continue its mission and to assure the effectiveness of VSHA as a provider and an administrator of affordable homes. What is the Mobile Home Improvement and Replacement Program? It really was created to work with homeowners and parks in order to address the lack of housing affordability and safety. So we have three components. We have an infill program for vacant or abandoned lots. We have an opportunity to do uh, home repair for existing homeowners. And we have the opportunity to provide new foundations for the placement of new housing opportunities. Between the ARPA, we were granted $4 million to start the program, and then through the state general fund, that was increased another $4 million. That $8 million includes program support, so not all $8 million goes directly to uh, the, the homeowners and the infill, but a good majority of it does. What we have at the moment, the financial assistance we have, $2.5 million will be for community small-scale infill grants, $750,000 for home repair financial assistance, and $750,000 for manu manufactured home foundation uh, grants. To this point, we have been open less than a year, and we have been able to facilitate the accommodation of $1.8 million to the various counties across the state. These, uh, you can see, we can also let you know if you're interested by which town, and that would be helpful for your constituents. Where has the money been spent? You'll see that the foundation deposits and foundation final, we have 39 new homeowners that have foundations with uh, that are HUD certified. We also have a little over $1 million that has been sent uh, spent on home repair projects. Oops, sorry. When we see homeowner contractor dollar amounts, we actually have uh, several homeowners, many homeowners that are doing their own work or working with folks that have their experience in doing construction, so are able to make that happen. The infill project has seen a little over $500,000 in order to provide new lots for new homeowners. I'd like to share with you some opportunities. What you're about to see are for folks who were homeless and are now going to be able to be in new housing. The first comes from a gentleman who is a contractor as well as uh, was precariously housed during the COVID situation. And this is the photo of his, his home before he was able to begin working on it. He has been able to do with $18,000 
a great level of work interior and exterior to ensure that he has a home to go to for a very long period of time. This situation is a situation where a family's home was burned to the ground. They were then able to access resources through the uh, through the state of Vermont to be able to be safely housed while the asbestos and foundation work were completed so that we can now put a new home in place for her. She is currently awaiting the hookups for the electric and water and sewer and will be housed very shortly. This is an info project, as you are all probably aware. Ludlow was hit very hard with floods and the park owner in this situation had already been trying to infill vacant lots, but it is a very costly situation. And so with our program, he has been able to uh, more than double the number of lots that he would be able to work on and provide a new home for folks to live in. When we look across the spectrum, what our work in progress is, we have had 492 applications in less than a year. Our program opened at uh, the end of February of 2023, and we have provided approvals to just under 200 of those applications, and we are pro continuing to process. We unfortunately needed to shut down the home repair program in May as the amount of requests that came in was far exceeding the amount that we were able to provide for homeowners uh, that needed repairs to their situations. We reopened the program November 16th and have seen 130 new applications and we are processing them as we go. I wanna thank you for your time. I would love to be able to answer any questions if you have them, but I also know that you have a tight agenda. So I have provided in my testimony the way to reach me. Great, thank you, Grace. Appreciate your um, sharing that information. And um, I know our committee has seen some of those slides or some of, those, some of that information. So um, thank you for sharing it. Again. I want to thank the opportunity, you folks, for the opportunity to do this amazing work. This is new for the state of Vermont. We have a great relationship with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development and CVOEO, without whom this partnership, without this solid partnership, this would not be able to happen. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we have two more witnesses left here scheduled. Lily Sojourner who is the interim director uh, for the Department for Children and Families and the Economic Services Division. And are we tag teaming? Yes, exactly. Yes. So um, Miranda Gray, who is a deputy commissioner of ESD at DCF is also here. So thank you so much for coming and um, thank you for being here throughout the whole hearing. Thank you so much for having us. And we, we will go quickly. We know some of you, many of you have seen some of this before. So we tried to add in some um, additional details. Um, but yeah, I think to echo what Capri said and what others have shared, we just really appreciate the attention on this topic today. We appreciate everyone being here um, to organize and to listen and to just take the space to recognize people's experiences and then all the hard work that people are putting into it. Um, so just we'll... Oh, I'm sorry. For the record, I'm Lily Sojourner, the interim director of the Office of Economic Opportunity. I'm Miranda Gray, I'm the deputy commissioner for the Economic Services Division, and um, we would like to thank the Vermonters who have shared their experiences with us today. It's really important that we're hearing that. So thank you. Okay, great. I mean, just um, again, this to kind of ground it, ground us in the numbers that we are seeing around the state, this is from last year's point in time count, um, which showed unfortunately increase in the number of Vermonters experiencing homelessness. Um, you can see that this continues to be an unfortunate trend um, that we're seeing in Vermont. And so, you know, again, today we wanted to highlight just some of the programs that AHS is supporting um, to address homelessness. And um, we'll kind of go back and forth between the two of us. And I'm going to be really brief knowing that I have shared this information um, with both committees already about the three programs that we're running. Um, so that is information is here. And then this is just updated data every um, week. We are pulling uh, new data to be able to share. This is on our website as well. Um, so I will 
continue on. Um, I think this is a, no mystery um, to this group either, um, is that we have been paying a lot for the motels. Currently, our average is $132 a night. Um, we continue to work um, to reduce these costs. Um, and we know that it's not an ideal um, scenario, having people be able to have access to shelters and case management, housing navigation um, is far more beneficial for everyone. Um, you know, a really key partner in this are our local coordinated mm -hmm. lead agencies. And it was great to hear from Jess Graff from Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity earlier today, because I think she really painted a picture of the work that she does in Franklin Grand Isle and that her counterparts do around the state. Um, so they're a great resource. And again, I appreciate you having Jess here today. We also at the Office of Economic Opportunity support um, partially Vermont Emergency, Vermont emergency shelter network um, to you know appreciate the efforts that people have taken and the investments that you all have made to um, increase our capacity um, you know to get back to pre-pandemic levels. I think we've shared some of these um, slides before in terms of the investments that we've made over the past year in terms of maintaining shelter capacity, expanding shelter projects and we have a number of projects both, in consideration in the short term and um, for next fiscal year, you know, we definitely want to be working with our community providers whenever there's capacity there. And we also understand how challenging and how much work it is to stand up these shelters. And, um, you know, and then we want to make sure that we're exploring alternatives if necessary, if community providers are not able to add capacity, but we remain in close collaboration with them. Um, these are other key investments we've made. Um, you know, our client financial assistance continues to be a significant resource for folks in preventing homelessness, as well as helping folks exit homelessness. So um, we appreciate the support, additional one-time funding for this program. We now have about $4.5 million that we're having available to community providers for this resource and about 50% is going to rental arrears to help people maintain their housing. And then um, the rest is going to help support safe exits from homelessness. Um, and, you know, again, this is just a, a great tool that we have and appreciate our local hot fund administrators who administer this program. Um, this is a summary of the expansion of our family supportive housing program, um, which, is a, which is great. and. Um, again, we've, we've shared this slide and you can see the summary of the expansion from where we started this fiscal year to where we are now. I did just want to highlight the role that our community service, um, community action agencies play through the community services block grant in um, addressing homelessness and housing insecurity. Uh, they provide a range of services and support. Some of that includes actually providing direct emergency shelter through emergency apartments or shelter units. And I just wanted to highlight that as part of our annual state plan process, which we do in the summer, um, we have an opportunity to identify what our priority is for Vermont based on the needs that we're seeing. And I don't think we always talk about the fact that we in Vermont actually do divert um, and utilize community services block grant to address housing and homelessness. And so I wanted to just highlight that today um, and appreciate the work that our community action agencies have done. For instance, you know, in Chittenden County, launching their core, their community outreach resource team. Um, we also support training and technical assistance through these dollars for the network of housing and homes providers around the state. And then are able to support individual initiatives in communities. So this is a resource that um, you know, is not explicitly for addressing housing and homelessness needs, but I wanted to take the time to call out today that we definitely leverage it to do so in Vermont. Um, just to identify some of the additional investments, and this is, um, you know, since I think we last presented, I think the number we had when we last showed this was maybe 82 families exited homelessness from with the home voucher, and now we're up to 90. <laughs> So I think to the, the theme of today, there's there's so much more that we need to do and what we're doing is working and impacting families every day. Um, you know, it's great 
to hear from Daniel and Caprice, our partners at Vermont State Housing Authority. They administer the Landlord Relief Program with us, and Caprice and I get to work together closely on that. We've had over 200 applications approved um, supporting landlords who are working with us to house Vermonters exiting homelessness or um, who are utilizing rental assistance. I don't know if you want to say anything from our rental subsidy, but I know BSD has expanded there, um, in particular to help people maintain housing to kind of address as we come down from federal investments during the pandemic. Um, we've supported with Vermont Department of Health, homeless health care capacity building projects over the past year or so. Um, and then we continue to support supplemental community resources through the Emergency Rental Assistance Program Housing Stability Services. So while the actual direct financial assistance has ended via OEO and through a few grants at um, our partners at Department of Housing and Community Development, continue to fund supplemental resources for activities such as housing navigation, housing retention, um, supporting being engaging landlords again and working with us as partners and also supporting legal consultation or representation in um, preventing uh, eviction. And so um, these continue through June 2025 and provide, um, again, the supplemental resources that we need to address our, you know, the current challenges that we're facing. I think as we've talked about before, you know, just these, this is what we know works. This is what we need in conjunction with each other. Um, I did want to share in closing just pieces from a letter that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development sent out in December when they released their point in time count. Um, unfortunately, there was an increase nationally as well when it comes to homelessness. So this is from um, their letter. Compared to the 2022 point in time count, homelessness grew by 12% overall. This is incredibly difficult data for us to take in but we must not be discouraged in our efforts to provide safe and affordable housing to all of our neighbors. Despite nationwide efforts assisting people to exit homelessness in record numbers, a challenging rental market with historically low vacancy rates, expiring pandemic era housing programs, and a growing number of people experiencing homelessness for the first time all contribute to this increase. We appreciate the Herculean efforts taken to meet these challenges, and this work is more important than ever. Our work is grounded in the belief that homelessness in America should not exist, that it is solvable, and that even in the most challenging times, we can make progress. And I think we share those sentiments at AHS and know that you do as well. Thank you. Thank you um, both for being here today. And again, um, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of challenges this morning for sure. Um, and um, I know that uh, your jobs are um, no less difficult than anyone else's that we've heard from today, including um, you know the people who are living through this in their in their day to day lives as as being people um, who struggle with their uh, ability to stay housed or to be housed or to um, deal with the impacts of having been homeless in their life. Um, so just. Uh, Appreciate that and appreciate everyone um, who testified today. Uh, as we, um, as Chair Stevens talked about earlier, we um, have a, at noontime a vigil on the State House steps and um, welcome you all to uh, join there. And um, yeah, thank you for, for hosting this joint hearing um, for our committee. Our morning we our next morning um, schedule could be postponed. It was just important to hear everybody today. I appreciate people who did testify. And was glad we didn't limit them to two minutes and um, <laughs> so that we could hear the stories that we did hear. And thank you to the um, administrative folks for. Uh, Yes, everybody needs improvement. We all need improvement in what we're doing, but it is an expensive issue. Um, it is a heart issue. It is a, it, it is a, um, I appreciate the time and energy that the, like, that you're putting into helping us and helping the other pieces of our community. Start by 
mitigating it and then trying to end it in, in ways that are humane. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, I think we can go offline now. <laughs>